I'm going to call tonight's meeting to order and recognize that tonight's meeting is being held on the traditional territory of the Sunamo people. Before we begin, I have another proclamation. Don't we love when I start these meetings with this? So tomorrow, October 5th, marks World Teacher Day. Uh, and this year, the theme for World Teacher Day is Teaching and Freedom and Empowering Teachers. And the theme recognizes the environments of crisis, conflict, and insecurity that many teachers exist in as a barrier to the UNESCO goal of ensuring universal primary and secondary education by the year 2030. In British Columbia, teachers are fortunate to teach in safer environments free of this type of crisis and conflict and insecurity that UNESCO focuses on on this year's theme. However, recent world events remind us that insecurity is never too far away. And it is because of the dedication and professionalism and passion of the teachers at the Nanaimo Ladies of Public Schools that we can feel confident that our students will be given the tools necessary to navigate these complex and changing times. And with these tools, we hope that they will be able to create a better and more compassionate world for us all. So in recognition of our traditional territory, I say hi Chika, to the tremendous passion that our teachers bring to our students each and every day. Thank you. Here, here. All right, so we'll move on now. Uh, is there any additions to tonight's agenda? No, seeing none. <coughs> any deletions? No? Changes in order necessary? No? All right. Any objection to approving the agenda? Okay. Any objection to approving the minutes? Seeing none. We will move into presentations for tonight, which begins with. Um, our Director of Instruction and our Vice Principal of Elementary and our Vice Principal of Aboriginal Education presenting on our retreat this summer and the Board Goal of Reconciliation. Thank you. It's a, an actually a huge honor to speak to this topic this evening. And as we, our, our board and our district, as we move forward in our journey uh, through truth and reconciliation, um, I'm happy to be here tonight to be a part of um, the steps that we are all taking together, particularly the steps that we're taking. One of the messages that I want to share with you before we begin is often we hear terms like decolonizing or indigenizing. And often we're probably scratching our heads, wondering, what does that mean? What does that look like, sound like, feel like? And we think about the Euro-Western construct that we exist in, the dominant culture that we exist in, a structure like a, a board system. And what I'm reflecting on is how you as a board have allowed another process to influence your process. And that is an effort toward decolonizing the system, and it's an effort toward indigenizing the system. And I feel very proud to be part of that, and I wanted to sort of hold my hands up to you to say thank you and to articulate and show a real live example of a system that is allowing this indigenization. So I thank you for that. And I'm going to invite Anne up, and Anne is going to lead us through this process this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, back on August the 24th at the retreat in Qualicum, many of you were there to participate in the blanket exercise. And we had uh, community partners from Aboriginal communities there as well. When Laura speaks of these big concepts of indigenization and decolonization, we saw that done in a really profound and beautiful way in Qualicum, in that First of all, the blanket exercise, we didn't host it in this room. We wanted to move it away from the, the officialness of this space and to give us enough space to comfortably include everybody. We, in following local protocol, we didn't want there to be any cameras or any videos taken during that time, but we still wanted to capture the essence of what happened that day and we did this in a few traditional but also innovative ways. One of the ways we did this was 
with these beautiful posters that you see around the room, these visual recordings. So we hired um, graphic artist Sam Brad to attend, who worked quietly in the background, capturing the essence of what happened during the conversation that I had with trustees on reconciliation, and then the blanket exercise and the closing circle, the debrief that happened at the end of the blanket exercise. We also incorporated local Coast Salish protocols by calling witnesses. This is done in many of our coastal communities, including local Coast Salish big houses, where witnesses are called and they are paid by the host family to carefully watch and listen to what happens during the proceedings and when called upon to return and to share out what they saw and what stood out to them. We will be continuing with some of that Coast Salish protocol tonight in that we have asked our witnesses who were there that night to please come to this meeting tonight. It's, you know, it's been a month and a half now almost and to share with all of us what was important to them about that exercise and for all of us here tonight to listen to what our witnesses are sharing with us and to hear their words, reflect upon them, and think about how we're going to take what they're saying now forward as we continue to unpack <coughs> and process and take action to our district goal of reconciliation. The witnesses who were there on August the 24th from our Aboriginal communities uh, were Inga Nielsen Cooper from Tillicum Lalem, Michael, Chief Michael Rakalma from Qualicum, who's here tonight, Lawrence Mitchell from Snanawas, Adam Manson from Snanamo, district witnesses Carrie McVeigh, Pete Sabo, Shauna DeBot, and Autumn Story. The host family from the district included John Blaine, Scott Kimler, Laura, and myself. So at this point, what I would like to do is to ask the members of our host family to please come forward. We will be once again paying our witnesses for doing this work tonight, and then we will be giving opportunity to our witness to come up, our witnesses to come up and please share with us. Okay, if our witnesses could please stand. The payment is protocol, follows Coast Salish um, witness protocols. It's highly symbolic in that we're paying for this, for this work, for these individuals 
they were paying special attention to this gathering and by accepting initial payment they knew that we could call upon them to come back at any point in the future to share with us about that day um, there's something else I wanted to say about that it'll probably come back to me later so at this point we are going to invite our witnesses to come up and to please share with us um, I would like to start with Lawrence Mitchell Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Would you like to go last? Okay. okay, thank you. Modernization. Heitz got the Til Siam at Tanaquail, Stenutz, Hacha, Totten's Demo, Nanutia Tallest, and Nemo, Schwalaqua. Just acknowledge the Creator and our ancestors today and our Stenemo. Uh, family members for opening up this space for this work to take place tonight. I squall once the snow now was in this name of the qualicum, what's lamna, what's the sea, I had done a quinant, nanu tiatala maklet, actually. So, as a nation, as a community, as a family, and as ind individuals, we have been dehumanized. It's like um, something was created to systematically deconstruct and eradicate everything sacred about who we are as Kwanlach Nestimuch. It has sent shockwaves throughout every generation of First Nation across Canada for thousands and thousands, even millions of people today. Throughout each wave of devastation from land loss, to residential school, from epidemics to assimilation policies to the creation of reserves, all of these uh, history, all of these happenings that took place, you know, touched every single one of us in some way, shape, or form. You know, and for the people that attended the blanket exercise, uh, they were able to look through an unfamiliar lens. We invited them into a space of pain and trauma because we opened ourselves up in a, a very special way. Um, no, I didn't know. Well, I kind of knew what a blanket exercise was. I YouTube did, I Googled it, you know, I <laughs> got familiar with it, you know, but <coughs> nothing can actually really prepare you for. The, the proceedings of something like that taking place. You know, you can hear about these things, you can read about these things, you know, uh, online, you know, or through social studies books about residential school, or, you know, you can watch it through movies, the things that happened to the Juan Mustimu. But once you actually take part in an exercise like this, you know, it takes you somewhere deep. You know, you're learning intellectually, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. There's much more taking place in an interactive way like that. And I really want to thank everybody at this table and what other tables that um, made, this made this happen. I really believe in my heart that the people that attended got something meaningful out of it. And I truly think that it touched them in a space and opened up their heart and mind for you know, more good work to take place at this table and all the other tables that you guys sit on. You know, I was, um, I tapped into an, an unknown space of trauma within myself on that day. You know, I didn't truly understand the impact that was going to take place. You know, I had tears coming from deep within my spirit all the way down my shirt. I was, I was like this, man, I was shaking. You know, I couldn't think straight. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what was going on. And I think a big reason why that was taking place because it was healing for my grandparents. You know, we're turning the page. We're going on to new chapters. And I'm really thankful and blessed that something like this takes place. And I hope that it, more things like this take place. And I truly believe that within this district, 
you guys are, have the hearts and the minds and the people to carry out everything that we need to actually work towards a healthier Canada. Reconciliation is not just a word. It's about putting belief back in a little girl's heart so missing and murdered indigenous women doesn't take place. It's about putting self-worth back into those kids so that they know, you know, they, that stuff doesn't happen. It's about creating healthy and safe environments for our children to blossom and grow. You know, I bring my daughter everywhere I go. So she learns and she hears the stories and she understands what happened to us as Holmuch and how we're all working together to repair that relationship. Since the beginning of time, our people have followed a set of protocols in what we call Snoayach. When um, this was taking place up in Qualicum on that day, um, we had to make sure that work was conducted in a meaningful way. We had to make sure that um, protocols were adhered to. We had to make sure that um, we honored the Coast Salish ways. And, you know, as a young person learning something like this, you know, uh, I can say in my heart that oh, that was a great day. It was a wonderful day. Um, you know, I acknowledge our Hulkaminam speaker, Jerry, Brother Jerry, he was there. <coughs> and the witness speaking in our Hulkaminam Shkwal. Uh, Brother Adam speaking, Brother Mike, everyone that was there. It was more than just being called to speak on what you, what you bear witness to, what you've seen. It was following protocols that have been there since the beginning of time. These sacred transactions took place in our big houses thousands of years ago to make sure the ceremony went as planned, to make sure that the certain name that was handed down was done in the appropriate way and acknowledging um, who the name belonged to. Memorials, coming of age, there were all types of ceremonies that were taking place that wouldn't be able to happen if there weren't witnesses there to provide legitimacy to the work. So I, I take it upon myself as a high honor and a high regard to be able to speak to the body of work that took place. I really feel it in here that you guys mean well. You guys want to learn more. You guys want to be a part of success and a healthy, growing, flourishing, thriving Canada. You know, that multicultural, happy, one big happy family everyone says about Canada. You know, when most of those people don't even know the dark history that took place. You know, we're shining a light on that. And we're beginning healing in whatever way, shape or form that we're doing it in. You know, I was really thankful that I was able to cry out those tears. You know, I didn't even know that I needed to be healed from that. So you guys have done a tremendous thing for me. You've done it for my child, for our nations, because I can be able to use that and transform it into myself to bring out more gifts, to learn new things about myself. Because I've lifted weights from the past and now I'm ready to walk into a newer future and be able to share things like what I saw on that day. And I really want to thank you all and raise my hands to every single one of you that you know made that happen, Laura, and all the other witnesses, all the people sitting around that table. You know, some of them were kind of not wanting to speak because of the, the impact of that. You know, when, but we went around again and they were able to speak on it. You know, they opened themselves up a little bit. It was good to see that we're moving in a good way. So I really want to thank everybody. And I'm really thankful you all made it here safely and that those of us that couldn't be here, I hope that they're okay in their, their path of life. And I really want to once again raise my hands to Tzitzel CM, without whom none of this could be possible. And I thank you all for thinking of me to speak on behalf of your body of work. And whenever you want to call upon me again, I will be there because I believe in this relationship 
I believe in the future that we have together and I believe that our children are coming into new times that's so much better. And I was talking to my daughter on the way here. I was like, these are the things that happened to your grandparents. How can you repair something like that? You know, needles and tongues, washing mouths out with harsh chemicals, beating, all of that stuff. It's like you can't repair something like that, but we can work together to try and understand it and share that with the rest of the world and move forward together. You know, it's scary to, you know, tell my daughter things like this, but she needs to know history. She needs to know why I'm here fighting today. Why people call upon me to come forward and share the things that I share. It's all coming from in there. That's where I live. That's where we all live. Sacred Huamach ways. Hichka Lawrence, we hosted this very important work on the traditional territories of the Qualicum. I would now like to invite Chief Michael Rakalma to please come forward. Good evening. Yes, my name is Michael Rakalma, I'd like the Chief of Qualicum First Nation. I would like to really echo what Lawrence had said. But the letter I got that I could speak to and I wonder about that, that day and to, like Lawrence again said earlier in his speech, it opened up things for me too, um, to see parts of your life that were going on on that, on that blanket, like you're going to go over here, you're not going to go to school, you've got, you've got to go on a, a taxi, you can't ride with the white people to school, you know, you're finally allowed into the school system, but you sit in the back. It did something that was never said in that, in that like you said. But these were things that, that happened in reality. And what I want to speak to, which most impacted me, was those ladies. That, that just were tears during the whole exercise. Because I've been heard and said, they call that a vicarious perpetrator. They weren't there. They weren't responsible. But they sure wore it. And, and like I told them, that's not right. It's not yours to carry. It's all of us to share it, to, to come together, to, to understand this. Now you, people that had never seen this, have been maybe a little bit better understanding of what we might have gone through, or our parents or our grandparents. So it might be a little bit of insight as to why we're the way we were. Why are we so quiet and secretive? And we don't trust you. <laughs> it's just, but it's, it's a new beginning. And I applaud for, for, for school just here, what you're doing now, for just doing just that. It, it's a step, it's a start. I get to school district 69. I don't think they do it there. I'm not sure, but it doesn't matter. I'm here today. I'm here this evening, and uh, to to again thank you all for what you did that day and for following protocol. Like Lauren says, it's been going on since time immemorial. These things must happen, and they still do happen. And we were paid, and here I am tonight to to speak to what what I had seen and what was my impact. And uh, I hope you continue the work you're doing. And uh, again, thank you for joining you on to come back to, to, to again to address this. I will be able to come back. Thank you. Hi, Chief Rakalma. Next, I would like to invite from the Snanamo First Nation, Adam Matson, who has also recently <coughs> joined our district as one of our, our newest Halkaminam language teachers. Adam? <coughs> Asiem nasia ya, anta sathe chala i chunitem sne Adam Anson tanik snach sne nemoch. I tsem mana ach chalt si mot i kuit witha i chunitem sne Gary and Donna Manson. Anta u kuit o nasasi la ach sne nawis sne nemoch i thok min. He tsem ka kwan zalapska ki atanakwea. You when your tap tayeth nam is doch to sweat swallowings at the sea eyes at Tanaquil. Hey, tap, hey, we see him. Before I like to begin anything, I always just like to follow my own teachings that I've got in my culture, is to just properly introduce myself. Hey, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sate Chalak and my English name is Adam Manson. I come from Shnanemoch. My parents are Chaltzimot and Kweet with the 
and their, and their English names are Gary and Donna Manson. And one of the important lines that I like to share is that I like to share that where I'm connected to through the bloodline of my grandparents, and that's Nanus, Nanaimo, and Shell Beach, which is just inside of Ladysmith. I really wanted to thank you all for gathering here today and giving me a chance to share a little bit of our culture and things that I learned at this thing. And I really want to thank the ones that put up the work today. Okay. So for the blanket exercise itself, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a, it's a very emotional one. And it gives the opportunity to share our dark history as First Nations people and how much it's impacted us in, in many ways and it's been handed down for generations. Okay, and on that day, all those emotions come out and it gives everyone else the opportunity to see some people are very sad and they can't even talk and they just cry. Okay, and then they'll just pass, you know, and then try to come back when they can try to regroup and gather themselves. Okay, because again, because that history is so dark and for others like myself, you know, it makes me angry when I have to talk about all the things that happened, what my dad went through and what what a lot of these horrible things that happened in, in, this, in this time. And people get to witness that firsthand. That's what that blanket exercise gives us, okay? And a lot of different emotions come out of that. But in the end, when we all come together and we all start talking about it, okay? A lot of people don't know the history. They don't know how, how harsh it was, okay? And this blanket exercise gives that opportunity, okay? And it gives us the opportunity to explain who we are as First Nations people and, and how strong we are and how resilient we are, okay? And it says a lot of these things on here. We have a lot of gratitude. That gratitude there, that word there. I'm very honored. I'm very honored to be standing up here and sharing some of this with you. Speaking my language that is nearly extinct. Coming up and I have the opportunity to do this in the district now and expand the language as much as I can. So I have a lot of gratitude for a lot of things and the ways that we are going. Okay, and, and um, to work in a good way is one that I really like there. That's where I'm trying to carry myself. I don't try to shy away from the history. Okay, I know what's been happened. I know how I've been impacted. My father alone is just a residential school survivor. Okay, so I have all of these emotions that I work on and we deal with, with a lot of things Lawrence and I'm talked about. We go, we deal with it on our own way, in our own snow way, our own teachings. Okay, but I, I, come in, I come up here and I want to work in a good way because that's what's going to help us all to come together. Okay, we're going to be able to educate as many people as we can. We're not shying away from that dark history that's been hidden and secretive for so long. It's starting to come out. And I'm, once again, I just want to say that I'm very honored to be a part of this and come and share some of this with you. Hi, Tech. Next, I would like to invite Autumn Story to please come up. Thank you. I didn't know what to expect of the blanket exercise. Uncharacteristically, and unlike some others, I hadn't Googled or investigated what was involved. I almost did on the way to it. I was that nervous. I also didn't know who would be participating. When I entered the room, I was startled by the number of people gathered, and as introductions were made, I was impressed by the many partners that were represented. When Elder Jerry Brown called the witnesses, I was surprised to be among them. Not certain of the protocol, I was admittedly feeling a little guarded. A blanket exercise is not a comfortable experience. Our history is difficult, often unfamiliar, and difficult to align with the pride we take in all that is beautiful about our country. We had been encouraged in the welcome by Laura to come to the experience with open eyes and open hearts, and I resolved to do so and be present in the experience. The history and facts presented in the narration was interesting, but they were not unfamiliar to me. As you can probably infer from my name, my parents were a little bit less than conventional, and so was my upbringing in many ways. Amongst them was the fact that my very Irish mother has worked since the early 1970s with First Nations organizations, and she's currently a clinical counselor with the Residential Schools Health Support Program, and has been for many years. 
First Nations role models, stories, art, and culture were present in my childhood long before they were embraced in the curriculum the way they are now for my own children. Further to this, I've spent most of my adult life in small forestry communities, all closely connected with our local First Nations. I have, through my work, been fortunate to work with many First Nations in enhancing and supporting employment opportunities for their community members. Given this prior exposure, I found the blanket exercise to be informative and undoubtedly meaningful, but not especially personally impactful until we began to discuss residential schools. I was startled to realize that I was a senior high school student when the last residential school closed. What struck me most, however, was a video of survivors speaking of their experiences, not only in residential schools, but also their memories of being pulled, in some cases literally, away from their families. I was not unfamiliar with the facts or the traumas of res residential schools. I understood with my head the reality of generational trauma and the cultural destruction achieved as intended by these institutions. What I didn't understand with my heart until that day it was the absolute destruction of individual family relationships and the decimation of children's trust that their parents would and could protect them. Scott Saywell and Laura Tate gave a powerful presentation for staff recently in which they noted that what you do not have to think about is your privilege. As a mother, I have the privilege of trusting that my children are well, of knowing where they are and how they are, of being confident that they know themselves to be loved, respected, treasured and safe of ensuring that they know they can always come home and be welcome. This was taken from mothers and children and families and communities, and that breaks my heart. We are all familiar with truth and reconciliation. Ann Tenning reminded me this week of a simple reality. Truth comes before reconciliation. When we gathered as a community that day, it could have been a gesture, a token, a political move. I'm proud to be here as a witness to the event to tell you that it felt like so much more. It felt like commitment, important, significant, and powerful. In a room full of partners and stakeholders, something a little bit magical happened. We were vulnerable, we were sincere, we were emotional, we were honest. Truth comes before reconciliation. Together, we acknowledge the truth. After the narration, we shared our reflections in the talking circle. There were many, many incredibly moving statements made, but those are not mine to share. As I listened, what occurred to me was that while the commitment that brought us together was one made by our Board of Education, what was truly remarkable was the commitment by all of the other partners gathered together. So many in that circle could have chosen to be skeptical, to give up, to resent, to hate, to, to dismiss, to avoid. But we didn't. Nobody did. Every person in that circle shared, whether on the first round or the second, when they were able. Everyone spoke meaningfully. With trust, compassion, and gentle grace, together we committed. When I got home, my son asked me what I did on my trip. And without thinking about it, I answered, we built hope. When we were called to witness, Elder Jerry Brown said amongst his invitation, thank you for not giving up on this beautiful family. To the board, staff, and all of the other partners walking this path forward with us, thank you for undertaking this commitment to reconciliation, for the strength to acknowledge truth, for the opportunity for me to be included in this important step forward, for the honor of bearing witness to this powerful moment of shared learning. Most of all, Thank you for not giving up on this beautiful family. Thank you, Autumn. Next, I would like to invite Pete Sable. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here and to speak as a witness uh, to the blanket exercise. I admire those who spoke before me because they have put down their words so eloquently and as to what they experienced. I'm experiencing still some 
I'm still trying to understand it all and process it all for myself and piece it all together. And, and so I'd like to share some what may be seemingly random thoughts and things that have happened since then. I too was uh, grateful for um, Laura's words with respect to um, understanding. It's a process of understanding. And I felt freed up to, to not judge, but to listen and to understand. I, I, I didn't really know what reconciliation meant. Um, so there was, a, there was an exercise with Scott and Laura that helped me understand a little bit. I went into the blanket exercise. I, I, I want to say Laura and say, I, I can, as a witness, legitimize the work that's being done. Um, I want to learn more and be part of the process in my journey. I want to talk about that a little bit. I, I'm starting to think about how I shine a light from my perspective and as a representative of the district and the director of a department, uh, I went in thinking about it from a goal perspective. There's there's a, a district goal and how am I going to implement that in my area and I should try and understand what reconciliation means. I think I've, I've begun my journey but I don't really understand, I don't fully understand what it means but I'm, I think I'm starting to get an idea. The blanket exercise was very effective to me in understanding um, in a very brief way of the history. Um, as it was going on, and I, I won't speak to some of the parts that the other speakers have, yeah. as it was going on, I found myself putting myself in the shoes of those involved and described in the process and uh, through the milestones that were, that were described to us through the, through the exercise. How would I react if, if I was relocated um, from my lands to another one? How would I cope? if my son was taken away from me. How would I have negotiated treaties based on the information that I have in the context? Um, started to understand, I think, then, what it must have been like and, uh, and, and the, the journey that, that peoples have gone through. It was an eye-opening to understand how the events, how, the, how it sort of all unfolded. I started, so uh, as a witness, uh, I started my own journey of understanding and reconciliation. Um, I went home that night and I talked to my significant other in, in quite some detail and had a great conversation, recounted witness to her everything that that it happened to me that day. Two or three hour conversation. It was brilliant. Um, uh, Michelle has some uh, First Nations an ancestry, so could relate to some of the things we talked about. I spoke later again to another individual about it and got a different reaction. And I think I started to understand everybody's individual journey in the process. Um, and the impact that it's had on others. And, and I, I draw myself back to what, what's my role? What's my journey? And boy, I wish I could speak as eloquently as Lawrence. Thank you very much for all of those comments on the, on the ceremony itself. Um, I, I've been now thinking about how do I implement the board's goal in a respectful way? How do I influence the people in my department to start their journey? I, I'm, I'm excited about that. It's, it's not quite the same goal as trying to get more efficiency out of custodian. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something completely different that is quite exciting. <clears throat> the more I learn, the more I listen to people, the more I understand the more honored I am to be involved in the process. And I want to thank the board and everybody involved in the process for 
including me in the blanket exercise, including me as a witness, and, and Scott and Laura to witness your presentation. It's very much appreciated and opened my eyes. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, Chica Pete. Next, I would like to ask Shauna DeBot to please come up. I've been a little bit frightened because I'm still as well kind of dealing with um, some emotions myself through the day. And uh, so my biggest thing I felt from it is I was felt fortunate to be a part of it for one thing and to be asked to be a witness thanks to the organizing committee. That meant the world to me. I felt a, a huge honor was bestowed upon me. So I feel a bit of a responsibility to report back on what I experienced. And for me, I, there's so many words that you could describe the day, the afternoon, the experience, but for me it was profound, stuck out for me the most, because the, to hear the stories, it's just something you'll never forget. <coughs> the biggest, one of the biggest ones for me was the history. I thought I kind of had known a bit and felt things <coughs> before and had an understanding and to actually go through the experience and be sitting on the blanket and be removed from the blanket because you, I believe I had um, chicken pox. I believe is why I was removed from the blanket. So it's quite an emotional experience, but having said that, I thought um, basically, I just gotta regroup, sorry. I feel that providing this truth to our nation will eventually build trust within our communities. So that was one of the biggest pieces for me. Hopefully we keep it together. The second biggest one for me, the word that stuck out, was reconciliate action. So as a, as a district and as people, we're in a power position to make bold changes in our schools, in our homes, and in our communities. So um, it's time, it's time to take action. Now's the time, and I think we have the crew looking around here to do it, so confident there. Another surprise for me was that we may be the first in the province to have done this experience, as far as bringing in, hosting the button blanket, not only for staff and trustees, but also bringing in our um, partners, our Aboriginal communities, and other community members. So that was a very empowering moment where it felt like we're onto something here. This is, you know, my people are going to be looking to us for what, how, how can we do that? What, do, what are you guys doing right? And how can we work forward with you guys on this? So working together was a big piece um, to make great strides towards the truth and reconciliation goal. Um, again, looking around the room then and now, I think gives me such great hope that um, for our future, for our Aboriginal students, our families and communities. And I'm looking forward, like I think we all play a vital role in, in how we move forward, but I'm looking forward to how I can contribute <coughs> in my role with the school district. So those are my, my feelings. I don't have a big long speech like, <laughs> like too much. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Kashana. Carrie, I'm going to put you on the spot a little because I didn't warn you that I'd ask you to come up to speak, but would you like to come up to share a few words as a witness? Um, I was one of the people at the blanket exercise that had difficulty um, speaking first time around. And, and I'm feeling that emotion again. What I'd like to say is that um, for me, I think... Um, well, first of all, I was just incredibly honored to be at the blanket exercise and to be with you today and to be part of this journey but I think that I've had so much difficulty because for me it was a, almost a physical experience you know and and emotional what I felt in that room that day was just um, so much vulnerability and connectedness and no judgment I can talk about the history piece and feeling so ignorant to so much of what I experienced that day but um, again, it, it's hard for me to even put it into words. It just really touched me at a, at a 
physical, emotional, mental level, and I just feel so much gratitude to everyone that joined us that day and everyone in this room and again as we move forward. I'd like to give a heartfelt Heitzapka to all of our witnesses who all spoke so eloquently tonight and all shared and brought different aspects of that day forward. This is so much more powerful than any video. And I'm really glad we chose to do it in this way. Um, we will also be giving copies of these posters to our witnesses. So before you leave, please make sure that I give you one of those so you can take it with you. It'll help as you continue to share the story of this work. Um, Laura, would you like to come up to make some closing remarks? It's a big night. I wanted to say thank you to everybody. And the words that you said today, all of you have resonated with me. My mom, my kids, all of those things. You've touched my heart, my mind, my spirit, all those good things. I'd say I've got to all of you. In closing, we would like to ask the Education Committee to please continue to think about what does the truth mean in truth and reconciliation. We would like to invite you as a committee to please take some time to reflect upon what was shared with you tonight and to return next time with some ideas as to next steps as to how we as a district continue to move forward with taking the goal of reconciliation to reconcile action. Laura reminded me yesterday when we were speaking about tonight's presentation that this work is really tightly connected to the First Peoples principles of learning, particularly that learning takes patience and time, and that we would like you to take the time, just as our witnesses have, to please give some time and space to really think about this tonight and what you heard and what you felt and how we move forward as a district, but also as partners with our beautiful communities. Heitzapka. These are some of the moments where I wish that Steve was sitting in this chair, because it would be his job to wrap this up in an eloquent way. And um, So um, I'm going to suggest when I'm done talking that maybe we take a few minutes. Um, you know, Laura, you talked about decolonizing and indigenizing, and, and I think we witnessed that here tonight. A, a very brief glimpse of that. Um, you know, still lots of work to do, but it, um, I think we brought that into this, this space. But right after this, we have to go back into a really bureaucratic system. So um, I, I would like to um, acknowledge the hard work that Anne has done to help the board, um, and Laura as well, to help us with this goal. And I think, um, Pete, you touched a bit on it, sort of like, how do I take this now and make this goal that we just plunked in there after lots of talk and process? It's not just a word. And I think, um, you know, we passed this recommendation, which became a board motion to um, help go on a process to define what reconciliation means, to create a definition of it. But we have to live it first. And, um, there's no guidebook. Uh, it's been mentioned that this hasn't been done before. So I am deeply appreciative for, of all the time that our witnesses gave tonight, um, that Anne and Laura are putting into helping us, and that our staff is, is working with us on this, and, and the entire education committee as we move towards trying to define this. It's, um, we're on a journey of reconciliation together, and hearing truth is such an important part of that, and I appreciate the resiliency of our communities to come and give us the truth and hear the truth and live the truth over and over and over again so that we can come to a place of reconciliation. Um, so it's, you know, there's so much gratitude that you are able to come with to us and give us that truth and, and hear that truth and live that truth again. Um, so this is, um, I, uh, I'm kind of at a loss right now, so I think maybe 
just finishing up with deep gratitude. This is a process. We're on a journey. There's not going to be, you know, a nice little definition after one meeting. We're going to keep going on this process so that we can be the examples. And I think that's the key here is that we're going to be the examples of living a path of reconciliation so that we can show our students, our community, our educators, and everybody that this is a possible, this is possible. We can do this together. So, hi, Chika. And uh, maybe we'll just break for a few minutes so that everybody can have some time. Good job. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
Um, our DPAC rep will be in in one sec. And uh, this <coughs> presentation is um, our superintendent's report that begins with an enrollment update, or, or do you want to jump straight to the FSAs and then do the enrollment update after? No, I think the, the enrollment update is very quick, if you know. Okay. Um, uh, just for the board's information, still very <laughs> preliminary. Um, we we are still anticipating that we're, we're going to be up from our projected uh, <coughs> a little bit less than what I reported out last time in an informal way as well. So, you know, we're, we're looking at approximately 100 students, both elementary and secondary, above projection. Um, and as we as we continue to work around those numbers, uh, there will be some slight changes on that as well. We saw also, we're seeing an increase also in our, uh, the BAS program, et cetera. Uh, BAS and CTC and those types of things. So there's some very good indi indicators occurring for us. Uh, we're still on the positive swing, as I said. I'm quite confident that we will come in over projection. And uh, which, which means that uh, we, we, we have, as I reported out last time, uh, added in some divisions across the system to maintain that, particularly in elementary. And um, we're hoping still, as we work through with the new finances and et cetera, and SEC, once that all gets done, uh, is uh, <coughs> we're looking at not touching the contingency at this moment. Uh, that, that can change if, uh, as we move through the year. point of my memory meeting, uh, a bit of twigging. I recall that we usually do get a big formal report that lists all the schools. Is that about two weeks? Is that the end of the month that we'll maybe we get that? Right. But once we secure the 1701s and all that information and we sort out uh, all of our uh, designations and things like that, it'll come out probably the third week of October. Okay. Maybe the end of October. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, um, I'll just ask a quick one. Maybe in that more uh, yes. robust report, we can also see areas. It's it's sort of top of mind for lots of people in yes. the community. You know where we're seeing growth, where we're not seeing growth, right. and it would be nice to have a little bit of a breakdown of areas we're seeing growth most, um, just so that we can be able to. Back to the chair. Uh, certainly, uh, if, if we don't have it ready for the end of October, we'll put it on. And, and do the work for that. Okay. Any other questions on this? Thoughts? So? Okay. Now we'll move on to our presentation. <laughs> so I had to sort of think of a segue. And when the witnesses spoke, I, you know, run around all day. This is, you know, and there's so much on our plates. And uh, we don't often get a, a moment to stop and consider. So when the witnesses spoke this evening, I just put everything down and I just listened. And I was just very, very present, which was really nice to do that for, for a couple of moments. So I appreciate that. So here is my attempt at a segue from that sort of experience that we've had that we shared together into assessment at NLPS. I was thinking about um, this presentation to the board around reconciliation and one of the pieces that Anne and I spoke about and then Anne and Stephanie and I and then Anne again was it's reconciliation action for sure and we want to think about this is we've gone through this blanket exercise and sort of broke down some of those pieces and what are our next steps and we're going to goal set and we're going to measure whether we get there or not. And, one of the things that we all three of us need to remind ourselves that we that Anne spoke so eloquently to at the end there was that it was important for you to hear the witnesses to hear their experiences in order for you then to decide and then you know resonate have that resonate with you and then move forward and make some decisions and move into the action phase but you need to be informed by those witnesses and, and their experiences before you made your next steps right that's my segue into formative assessment <laughs> How's that? Right, one of those segue things around Yes, that too. So, formative assessment. 
that's what teachers do in our classrooms on a daily basis. They work with their students, um, they look at their strengths are, their weaknesses, their next steps, and it's usually right in the moment, often right in the moment, right there. Common formative assessment is that same formative assessment, but then that same assessment, or that, assa that same assessment data is shared with other teachers or other educators, so they can now talk about that formative assessment, that formative assessment data, and plan, plan interventions, plan support with one another um, in order for them to move the learning in their classrooms forward. Common formative assessment. Here in Anna Lady Smith, as I said, we have all sorts of assessments going on in classrooms every day. Some of the broader ones, some of the more district-wide assessments that we have, of course, that you know are NLPS reading assessment. Lots of schools have our school-wide rights. Um, we have our math assessments, our district math assessment. We have things like running records often in our primary grades or intermediate grades. And these are assessments that are used on a regular basis in classrooms all the time around the district. And when they're common, teachers can come together and speak the same language. going to segue in us into the foundation skills assessment. Lisa Robinson is our district principal for our learning framework and one of her portfolio aspects is the FSA. So Lisa and I are going to present a little information around the FSA. Basically in a snapshot just to remind each of us so that we're on the same page. It is a assessment in the areas of literacy and numeracy. It occurs in grades four and seven and it's created or has always been created by a group of educators uh, and metrics experts. And it provides a system level inf information on student performance. It provides the district and schools with information on student performance and it supports decision making um, for planning interventions and resources and allocating into the curriculum and policy and research. So we have, because we have a new curriculum, we have a new FSA. And the quick facts around this new FSA, when this assessment used to occur in the winter, it now occurs in the fall, right at the beginning of the school year. It includes some activities and assessments in the areas of the core competencies. There are choices. Of, Two choices of reading themes. It still takes about four and a half hours. Um, which are, can be broken down into smaller parts. And with the online portion, those the raw, the raw result of the raw data is available immediately for teachers. And the marking still remains at local level. So marking still occurs within each district. The Foundation Skills Assessment has four components. Uh, there's two new components. First is the collaboration activity, which aligns with the new curriculum. And then there's the uh, student booklet, as well as the online component, that's reading, writing, uh, and numeracy. And then a new um, area is self-reflection issue. So what remains the same with the FSA? Is it still developed by BC educators? It still assesses reading, writing, and numeracy? It's administered, as I said, in grades four and seven, but because it's administered at the beginning of the year, it's actually assessing the content from grades three and six. It includes uh, online and sort of paper-based or written components. Uh, still t takes about the same amount of time and it's still scored locally. And then what's new is the administration time. It's October, November, instead of January and February. It includes a group collaboration activity at the beginning of the assessment. And this time it includes a choice of reading themes for the students. And it uses a variety of engaging questions and formats. Um, and then at the end it includes the student self-reflection. And it's reported on proficiency skill this year. So those are some of the highlights. And I think um, when we think about all of our assessments that we have, the variety of assessments that we have that occur um, in our classrooms. And we think about the fact that the FSA is a provincially mandated assessment, and we think about leveraging some of the pieces that make the most sense for us. 
those are the fact that it now occurs at the beginning of the school year. So the ministry has placed it at the beginning of the school year so the data can be more readily accessed at the beginning of the school year so that teachers and schools can use the information provided by this assessment to inform future instruction. The online, as I said, the raw data in the online parts of portions is available immediately. Uh, the the uh, written portion of the assessment can be used by a variety of grades, by a variety of classes, and if in our school district we are already doing school-wide rights, so that the, this FSA writing component can be used instead of the, the school-wide right that's already occurring, so that kids aren't writing that writing assessment twice. Because the BC curriculum is still quite new to us, our assessments, we're still trying to play catch up in that regard. For example, our district math assessment, we're only able right this year to pilot our grade six math assessment. In past, the math assessments have been assessing mostly content, and the new curriculum focuses a lot more on competencies. And so a lot of our math assessments don't assess those competencies yet. It's gonna take us a little while, a number of years, to get up to speed with all of our math assessments. The FSA is up to date, so it's providing uh, data on the new math curriculum. And this FSA has, as Lisa has illustrated, a couple of components that are utilizing the core competencies like self-reflection, collaboration, etc. So if we look at the common form of assessment blender. <laughs> <laughs> um, as educators, we want to take the best of what's out there. We want to take a variety of assessments and blend them together to inform what we're doing with kids in our classrooms, with kids in our schools. Thank you. Uh, there's some question. There's one question so far, but I just I just want to bring this back onto the agenda. And the, the request here is that we rescind, that we recommend that the board rescind a motion from two years ago. I'll be speaking to that. You're going to speak to that? Okay. So let's deal, knowing that that um, is going to come, would you like to do that first, so that people can frame their questions and help understand the discussion based on that? Or do people just have questions in general about the FSA? Do you have questions about that? Okay. Yeah, you mentioned that there are reading themes, and I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more, like how many different themes there are, um, what are they based on, and do they include Indigenous learning, which is part of the new curriculum? That's a good question. Yeah. Part of the writing team uh, includes um, First Nations ed ed educators, so there is a First Nations theme grouped throughout the assessment. Um, in terms of the reading assessment and choices, I was looking at the grade four one. There's two based on um, more of um, a thinking component versus a doing component. So, for instance, with the grade four assessment, it's about Lego and play, the doing piece, and then there was more of a thinking reflection on a skill set. Okay, thank you. I did the grade seven one. How'd you oh. do? I don't know, I didn't see my. <laughs> but I did do them. And the, the reading is set, the two choices, they're sort of themes. One of them was survival. And then there's two stories that you read about that, and I couldn't remember what the other one was. Right now I can't remember, because maybe I chose the survivor one. Well, hopefully you did, because you don't remember what the other I one know. was. I <laughs> know. So, yeah. so they give you these two sort of choices of, I don't know, like an emotion or a... Like you can You're bringing down the curve, man. Yeah. So. I got a question. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Can you please expand on uh, the point that says created by teams of educators and measurement experts? Who, who is all involved in creating it? Those are BC teachers and teachers from the Yukon. Mm -hmm. And then metrics specialists. So they're, they're, they're the ones that are in there from the ministry that are going to help sort of create the scoring system. Okay. okay. Thank you. And First Nations teachers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other questions at this point? I kind of have one. Okay. I'm Go just wondering, um, kind of more on a technical level, like are there any like tools or any kind of like software or any kind of things that is needed to support this? Computers. Computer. Basic mm -hmm. computer. Yeah, with a mouse, maybe a touchpad. So there, okay. Yeah, it's quite user friendly. There's drop down menus for the app. They, they actually, uh, visually, it looks a little bit different. 
than last year's. So there's drop down menus and click and drag answers. And then you can close screens or open them to a wider view. So. You're actually moving, like you can move, the question is a picture, and you can actually go into the picture and move the scale or move the, the thermostat or whatever the question might be versus just A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can move the answer into the. That's yeah, right. It's, yeah. yeah, it's cool. Mm -hmm. It's interactive. It's more interactive. Trustee um, Brennan? Thank you. Um, who will score the new FSA assessment? The online component, as you know, goes through a metric system at the ministry. We'll mark those locally, and in past, most recent past, we've had principals and vice principals come and mark those. Again, some schools are moving toward, for example, to take the writing component and that writing component then provides the school-wide school right, then as they have always, teachers will mark and mark those um, schools. Um, Ken? I have a question, but it's in relation to the um, motion, not a question in relation to the presentation. So I'm just seeking advice Maybe on- Maybe hold on to that until okay. we enter that conversation. Yep. And right now we'll save questions for the presentation part and then we'll have that, I have a feeling there'll be time for that discussion <laughs> for sure. Charlene. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, just thinking about moving the, or since it's moved now into being an earlier time frame. Our students predominantly, as they're leaving primary, have been working on iPads and not on the Chromebooks or computer labs. In some schools, we don't actually have computer labs anymore. So what type of skills are those kids being given prior to actually working on these tests around their computer skills to make sure that they're able to complete them after in the best, so that they're properly supported prior to starting? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, in terms of being prepared just with the tool itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, so there are sample um, online samples and, and that students can practice and kind of try to just get comfortable with that. So may I follow up? Mm -hmm. Is that occurring at school prior to the test or is that something yes. that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. That would be the expectation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, if you could just clarify for me what you said about the math assessment. Ours versus the ministry and the curriculum changes. I don't think I understood exactly what you're saying. So, what's changed in large part in the new BC curriculum is this notion of competencies mm -hmm. versus content. Right. So competencies. So tell me if I just skip ahead. Yeah. But so comp so content um, are more kind of recalling of facts, things that are a bit more tangible, um, which are important, and then the competencies are more the skills and the behaviors associated with that content. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. So one is doing the math, one might be, you know, behaving like a mathematician. Okay. Um, to simplify that. Yeah. So we're, in, we're in, the new curriculum has increased the notion of the competencies, the how we're doing things. So when we have assessed math up until this new curriculum, we're assessing what's in the curriculum, which in large part has been the content. As in time <coughs> tables, right? Um, and <coughs> then now that the curriculum has changed to include the competencies, we mm -hmm. have to assess the competencies. So there's a couple pieces there. It's still new, so it's going to take time for folks in the province to build new assessments to get a sense of how kids are doing. The second piece is competencies are not always kind of a multiple choice, pass, fail, yes, no mm -hmm. kind of assessment. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be a little more complex and it's going to take us a little while to wrap our minds around how we're going to assess those. So work is, is going on with those around that uh, achieving, sort of getting those assessments completed. They're going to take a little while. The district math assessment is what we use here. We use on the island. It's, a, it's, an, it's an, an excellent math assessment, but it's not measuring at current time. It's not going to measure the, the competencies. Okay in math yet, so we still need to build those components. Trustee Solomon? Just to expand a little bit on the uh, uh, teams of education measurement expert, but is it is the BCTF, have they, have they been actively engaged in this process, and are they, are they appro approving of this process? Well, teachers have been actively <coughs> engaged in creating the FSA, and they always have been. Um, I, I don't know what I need to comment on the BCTF's position on this? I well, we have a member at the table. <coughs> Perhaps the member can answer the question on... Okay. Yes? Oh, I'd, I'd okay. love to. Yeah. Okay, so 
Um, yes, teachers, VCTF teachers did participate in the revision of the FSA, but they did so on the premise that the data would be masked. So in other words, the data would not be able to be captured by any other organization. And of course, the organization that has always been difficult is the Fraser Institute. As soon as it was re um, understood that the provincial government would not mask the data, um, BCTF pulled away. Other questions for our presenters? No? Thank you very much. Don't go far. I have a feeling there might be more questions for you. I mean, you can sit. Sorry. I just said, don't run away. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, moving forward with this, uh, um, I'd like to touch upon a couple things uh, around a motion that uh, the staff is recommending for us to move forward with. So, uh, there, there has been basically a three-year working plan to develop uh, the NLSP and the formative assessment directed by the board. And uh, to refresh the board's uh, memory, there was a continuous improvement of instruction and assessment for governance policy 1.3. Uh, that was created prior uh, to this board and it included uh, several different uh, points around assessment and the, the districts uh, moving forward in creating some forms of assessment to inform instruction, <coughs> to inform us for the ability to look at uh, where funding and support could, uh, could occur and to give us some indicators of uh, the success of the, uh, of the system, of what we're currently doing, what are the changes we may need to do, and uh, of course use that to inform ourselves on attempts to improve the system. The three primary points in that was point number one, ensure that all learners participate in provincial, national, and international assessments. Number two, identify and support the implementation of the district assessments in order to provide for continuous improvement of instruction and assessment to enhance student learning at the local level. And then it goes on under the direction of. And number three, to promote and utilize school and classroom assessments. Um, the staff and teachers in, uh, in the NIMO have been working <coughs> diligently around the formative assessment pieces and district-wide assessment. We feel that we will accomplish this uh, uh, task to the majority of it uh, by the end of this year. So that would be the end of three years. We also feel that it's important that, uh, that all grades have some type of assessment being created in a formative way, uh, uh, both uh, by the teacher's choice and who's most closely connected to the student, and also some of the district formats necessary and required to move us forward uh, in, 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 in an intellectual way with information and data to inform us around how to support instruction. <coughs> in 2015, uh, the, the board approved a motion to, and I believe uh, intended to acknowledge the NDTA's desire to time that principals not follow up with parents who requested non-participation of their child in the foundation skills assessment. Many of the reasons and rationale used at that time was the basis of when the, uh, when the assessment was created, teachers were not able to use that assessment in a very structural way to inform their, their teaching strategies for the current students that are there, and it didn't follow cohort groups uh, in, in any significant way. <coughs> so as you experienced and saw today, there are many things changed in this, uh, the new foundation skills assessments to alleviate some of those things, to get it in the hands of teachers in a, in a quick and speedy way, and to lead them uh, in their instructional strategies. Uh, you heard that tonight around the BC curriculum and, and, and the nuances around that. Uh, over the past three years, as I stated, that uh, we've been working diligently and hard 
with teachers. We have some very, very strong teacher leaders out there working uh, from K to 7 and from, from grade 8 through 12 around this area. And it has been a focus of uh, that this board has directed staff to work on around the new curriculum and assessment for the last three years. And this, there is, I would suggest it's significant monies, and, but as significant as we can get, focus uh, by us into those two streams of elementary and secondary to bring this uh, uh, to the forefront. It's important to be mindful that the foundation skills assessment is necessary and informs student progress, uh, but this is what, just one of the methods, as I stated, and teachers still have an access and battery of different assessments and tools that they will use. What this would signify for us, uh, uh, we're going to ask the board to rescind uh, the original 2015 motion so uh, staff and principals and teachers can, can begin the work to look at all students uh, in some type of formal, uh, formative assessment and not to overburden, we can begin to work with that the possibility of grade four and grade seven, the foundation of that form of, of assessment would be the, the uh, FSA, Foundation Skills Assessment. And then we can plan so that we are not as you can see, four and a half hours of, uh, of, at different time periods put towards the, uh, uh, that, that assessment, we're not then having those young students necessarily having to do the NLPS. So they're not going to be required to do both. They would, we can plan that out in our school so that this is the core piece that we require and we can, we can make sure that that can be followed through then in our overall assessment and used for that tool. Um, there is a, uh, as we are educating our teachers and uh, around this and our, and our principals and staff, uh, we need to then begin to filter, filter it out. Many parents are well informed of this process, but the pr one of the primary pieces that will have to be developed and we're prepared, we have a communication plan prepared to inform parents of the importance of these types of uh, formative assessments. And from our side, uh, in the side of whether or not we're talking science or not, but from our point, this is not about the politics. This is about helping us and teachers be informed to improve instruction and uh, so we appreciate and the board can make you, uh, maybe some other choices to it but this particular motion the motion from 2015 is now we feel contradictory to the policy that the board has given us in the past uh, around uh, uh, ensuring that all learners uh, have that assessment and so that's kind of the background and why we're here with this today. Okay, uh, speakers list. I saw your hand go up. Was that to be on the speakers list? Okay, mm -hmm. good. So I have, I get to go first because I'm the person who keeps the list. I just want to, because you just talked about, you know, all of our NLPS that we're doing. So what we're talking about is grade four and seven only here. The other grades would still be doing the NLPS stuff. That We're not going to get rid of all of the great NLPS work that's been done on right. assessment. Yeah. We're just talking about grade four and seven here. Right. So, so just an explanation to that is when we started the, the journey around uh, uh, NLPS, we didn't realize or we, we had no knowledge of it and they weren't working on the FSA at that time. And so we, we fully de we developed the full battery of that. We still have the grade four and sevens. It may be used as, uh, as an alternate or something that we may require in some other times, but the intent of this would be in grade four and seven, they would do the FSA and NLPS would be delivered in all the other groups. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. So I'd like to share with you that the NDTA agrees that a conversation around the revised FSA and a fulsome conversation around assessment <coughs> um, is really important. And I shared with you the information about BCTF being part of developing the revision of the FSA on that premise that the data would be masked. 
and um, they pulled out when they realized that the provincial government had no intention of doing that. So, um, and assessment, teachers do assessments in their classrooms all the time for as an of learning. And as important as the conversation is, <coughs> Uh, it needs to be placed in abeyance if, with respect to the FSA at this time until such time as the provincial government agrees to protect that data. And so given that in 2015 you agreed that parents' choice to withdraw their students from the FSA should be honoured, and given that the provincial government has not moved forward with masking the data, and given that the Fraser Institute will continue to capture this data and prepare their ranking documents that shames districts, schools, teachers, and students. And given that ranking of schools diminishes the work that we do. My question is, what has changed that would compel the trustees to decide to not honor parents' choice to withdraw their students from the FSA. Okay, just hang on one sec. There's lots of hands. I don't so know. we've just been asked a question of the board, but I think uh, I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to allow people to start answering this one one at a time. Okay. So I think yeah, just give me one sec. Um, I appreciate the question, and I'm going to take it, and I the, the the board members of the education committee can take it as a point of thought rather than actually taking the time to answer you one by one. I don't think that would be beneficial to our time here tonight. So I, unless anyone has a strong objection to that, I think the best thing to do is to have people, um, you know, they can, they can think about it and have their answers in other statements. Yes? Well, like the question is uh, through you to staff, I believe, the staff are the ones that are competent to answer. And so that was going to be the next step, is that I think that we can have staff answer what's changed, why they're bringing it forward, but I don't think we need to have everybody on the board start no, putting their hands up. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. And thank you for reminding me. Uh, this is not about uh, suggesting to parents they don't have the right uh, to not have their child right uh, the FSA. They certainly have that right always. We're not uh, taking that, that piece away. What we are suggesting is that principals have the ability uh, to contact the parents in a full conversation about the uh, rationale and understanding around the FSA and the importance of formative assessment. If the parent again decides that they do not want to have their information forward to the ministry, we will respect that. And or we will respect the, uh, the thought that they may not have their child write the, the formative assessment by not having their child in school that day or whatever process they have decided upon. And it will be the, that will leave us with the teacher and the principal making some decisions around how to create the formative assessment that would be required separate from FSA uh, for that child for grade four and grade seven. So it's not exclude, what we're suggesting is it's not going to exclude them from a form of formative assessment. But uh, uh, with the ability to, to have all the grouping together, the large grouping together, we can uh, offer it all at the same time and et cetera, and there's some expedience to that. You can well imagine if you're having individual students at individual times, it becomes a form of So we're not suggesting parents don't have the right to keep students out of the uh, out of the FSA, they still have that. We're suggesting by rescinding this motion that we can continue to communicate uh, with the parents, talking about that them so they're well informed of what their decision means and <coughs> how we will respond to it at the school level to ensure that there is some type of formal assessment created and worked on with that child. Uh, Trustee Brennan. Me? Oh. <coughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're right. Scott's next, Trustee Kimler's next, and then, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple things, I guess. Um, <clears throat> first of all, it sounds like the couple changes to the FSA uh, sound very positive. One, the fact that they're moving it earlier into the year, into October, means that the data will have some value for that, that um, school year, and that it caters to the new curriculum and, and all other aspects and except for perhaps some of the mechanics it seems pretty much the same old same old um 
a question I guess to staff would be uh, so for grades four and seven we will be relying solely on FSA ass assessments and not the Nanaimo Ladysmith Schools assessment certain components in the area of say um, for immediate feedback we can use the math portions um, for something like a school-wide right we could have the school-wide right topics for grades four and seven kind of span grades four five six and seven and that's what the school can use as topics um, so i think it'll be more of a blending <coughs> versus one replacing the other okay um and then a question I guess also would be with the addition of the language that trustees put in place in 2015 have we seen a significant decline in participation rates of FSA during the during or after that time period yes. what sort of percentage drop or I don't have a percentage but we've seen a, I would say it, particularly in some schools we could have gone down as long as probably as low as 50 yeah. percent yes I'd agree with that just to, to clarify though, not necessarily due to just the motion, across the province there has been a decline as well. So it's hard to abstract out uh, the difference. Okay. Um, and with respect to the comment from um, the NDTA president, my, my concern with the notion of masking the data is that it's um, something that probably, I, I don't see it ever really happening because the, the Ministry of Education, which is a publicly funded body, has a responsibility and a right to report out on um, the success of the, the student learning and the assessments is one of those. And, and so I think that those data will always be made public and, and it's unfortunate that it's utilized in the manner that it's utilized by the um, Fraser Institute, but I, I, don't, I don't ever see it not being published, but that's just my opinion. Thank you. No, trustee. Thank you. Um, yeah, the issue of the uh, is of the uh, freedom of information that uh, the Fraser Institute relies upon to access the data uh, from the FSA. And, and in looking at what was presented, not much has changed. The previous uh, assessment was developed by teachers, and administrators, and and metrics people, um, as was this one. Uh, we have a new government. And uh, I think almost every year, this board has passed a motion appealing to the government to withhold uh, the uh, FSA data from all except uh, teachers, parents, and, edu and, and administrators. And it's gone to Victoria, and it's gone to the round file, I guess. But perhaps with the new government, and, and by comparison, it, data, um, data uh, uh, obtained by hospitals with regard to their services is private. And it's not because of their, you know, personal medical records. It's because it's, it's, it's cumulative data on their operations, their services. And it isn't released to the public. So I don't see why uh, a government that won't release hospital uh, rec data uh, on research uh, wouldn't withhold this information if appealed to. Uh, and being a new government, perhaps wanting to um, not embarrass um, schools, children, parents, and anyone else. The Fraser Institute is not what we would call a left-leaning think tank, and therefore is not a great supporter of the party that is currently in government. So I would suggest that we, we do pass another motion asking for this government to restrict the uh, release of this information to those parties I mentioned. And we do it in a, in a, in a strong and vociferous way, and then we ask our colleagues in other districts to do the same thing at NBCSDA so that we can, we can come at them as a united group uh, with this kind of appeal. Um, on the issue of, 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 of reliability, I think it's important that we get as many children doing this assessment as possible. It's good information and teachers can use it um, to help them prepare to, uh, um, for students to, be, to achieve a greater in the classroom. So, it's, it's, the, it's not the assessment that is offensive. In fact, it is a tool amongst many that the teachers can use to assist students 
it is the use to which this information is put by a right-wing think tank to um, prop up the private system and, uh, and, uh, and try to embarrass the uh, public system. So. Um, Thank you. Trustee Bennett stole a bit of my thunder, but not all of it. Uh, let's be clear, the Fraser Institute is doing more than attempting to embarrass the public system. They are attempting to undermine the public system. They are attempting to dismantle the public system. That is their ultimate goal. I have no interest uh, as a trustee and as an advocate for public education in supporting them in doing that. I have looked at this motion and thought about it and reread it multiple times since the agenda was sent to us. There's nothing in this motion that prevents parents from, from continuing to participate in this test if they, they wish to. We, and, and there's nothing that, to, nothing has changed in, 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 there's nothing in this motion that says the FSAs are bad. The original motion, the one that we passed in 2015. We're simply giving information to parents and allowing parents to make a choice based on the, based on unbiased information on both sides. I see no reason to change that. Thank you. Uh, you guys are talking about so many different things. I'm going to focus on the purpose of this recommendation. Mm -hmm. I believe that at every opportunity, um, the principal of a school should take every opportunity they have to discuss all educational decisions regarding the students with the parents, including the option to opt out or participate in the FSA test. I think that those conversations will lead to more education for parents as opposed to talking them in or out of a decision. I don't think that's the purpose. I think the purpose is to educate a parent. And I don't think that there should be a board motion standing in the way of an opportunity to, for a relationship between a principal and a parent to have that conversation about the child's education. I'll leave the rest of it to you guys. Robinson? Just a <clears throat> quick clarification uh, to the superintendent through you. Uh, a parent can choose to have their child write the FSA, but that information not be shared out? I didn't know that. The, through the chair and the floor is there as well. I know, uh, and, and Lisa, the um, the written component is, is easily not forwarded on if the parent wished that, right? And so because it, it's marked <coughs> locally, uh, we are able to run copies for the teacher to use uh, primarily. Uh, the computer uh, component of it is it still, it, to yeah, so mm -hmm. it's still in question and we will work through that as we go along and if the parents uh, felt strongly <coughs> that uh, that component they, they did not want, uh, certainly I, I think those conversations could occur at that time. Didn't know that. Mr. Chair, um, we often uh, obtain waivers or, or permissions from parents for their children to participate in certain activities. Don't we? Yeah. Is, is it, uh, this is a legal question uh, that I'm not capable of answering, but is it possible that uh, district parents might uh, sign a form that, that forbids uh, the release of uh, this information uh, obtained from the test beyond? The, the, the parties that I named earlier. I mean, who has a right to this information? The information? Well, the, say, the score results. Yeah. Who has a right to it now? And we, I guess it's the, it's all the parties mentioned, yeah. plus any party that wants to obtain it. Uh, I'm not sure of but where we would fit legally. Yeah, I mean, that's my question is, uh, might we ask if, if it, it's possible for parents to, um, forbid the release of information beyond educators. <coughs> we, can, we can explore that. <coughs> okay, uh, so I just, um, the BCSCA has written a letter asking to not release the information publicly and, and other boards are doing it as well. So we would be part of a group that's doing that. Um, I agree that um, the Minister Rob Fleming is on record time and again in his time as a critic, expressing, you know, denouncing the ranking of schools. And so I think the time to act for this is now. Um, and this is a real tough one. Like, I really struggled with this. 
<coughs> but some of my objections three years ago when this motion was passed what was to the the fact that it it lacked any kind of real academic weight and use you're testing kids in january for things you're supposed to know in june you're not getting the results <coughs> in may what was the point of that it like was fundamentally opposed to any kind of formative assessment it didn't even meet the summative assessment it just <coughs> stank all around but it has been updated now and those concerns have been addressed it's now happening at a time in the year where teachers can use it. And, um, you know, research shows time and again that assessment for learning does help improve teaching and learning. And um, this is being done. There's lots of great work that teachers are doing on assessment. Um, and the, the district is doing on assessment, but we're only talking about grades four and grade seven. We're talking about two grades in their seven years um, where there could be a different touchstone that is is used. Um, so, uh, you know, while I did object <coughs> strongly to the test three years ago, my objections are less so to the assessment now. I'm going to use the word test because it's not a test; it's an assessment. Um, to the actual assessment now and to the rankings. So, if it's going to help us make decisions on resources and help us advocate for stronger and better resources for our students then I am not opposed to our students writing this assessment. I think um, as a parent, I like to know how my student is doing. And while I do know that every year they are being you know, assessed continuously by their teacher, sometimes it's just nice to have a different opinion that corroborates what is being said. Um, and, and I do, I did, I did them all. So I'm a big nerd. Um, I did the four, I did the seven, I did the numeracy, I did the, the literacy and, and um, they're different, they are different, very different than what they, they used to look like. Um, and they're much more interactive. And I love that they are now um, completely aligned with the new curriculum. That was another problem with the old one. They just were not aligned with the new curriculum. So um, I, you know, um, I do think we should work on ha not having this um, information released publicly, but I do think we should give the benefit of the doubt to the good work that's gone into creating this assessment. Um, and, and work hard over the next couple of years to have this, uh, advocate hard for this ministry to um, you know, live up to the words that were spoken during its time in opposition. And, um, and if in a couple of years we see that this is still happening, then perhaps that's the time to revisit. But right now, that the academic value of this assessment, I think, is, is worthy for our students. And I really appreciate the point that you made about having the opportunity for principals to actually engage with their parents of their schools about learning. That's an excellent, excellent point. So I appreciate that. Trustee Kimler. Yeah, I'd like Trustee to move Kimler. the recommendation. Oh. Okay. So the recommendation has been moved by Trustee Kimler <coughs> and seconded by Trustee Ray. Well, I'll just speak to it a little bit. I think you've made some good points and um, I <coughs> certainly appreciate the DPEC's position about conversations about student learning. And, and I think ultimately at the end of the day uh, with a restructured FSA, uh, when we take the political side of it out, um, really we're talking about an assessment that teachers can use that will help inform um, their teaching for children so that they can get a better education. And, and uh, for, for that reason, you know, I totally support the rescinding of that motion that we made earlier. Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to it. Um, thank you for everybody's thoughts on this. Um, it, I think nobody can argue the fact that uh, the more information we have, the better decisions we make. And this is just one slice of several different uh, slices to gain information. I thought uh, Laura's presentation using the blender is an excellent example of um, how we can take all of this and put it into one piece to help us make better decisions to educate our kids. And that's the main reason why we're all here today. I, I get the, the Fraser Institute piece, and I do. Uh, Trustee Brennan said it. Uh, Trustee Higginson has said it. I think it's time to challenge the current government. They, they talk the big game in opposition, and uh, I think it's important for our board and others and the BCSTA to hold their feet to the fire about this. And I think we have an opportunity to do it strongly, and we should. Um, but I am in full, so, you know, also not to mention it, it's one of our board goals is, you know, assessment. So 
I think it is it is important that uh, we we support this motion and also um, challenge the government to to move forward in a different way. So I support. It. Thank you, Trustee Robinson. Yeah, it's the uh, what ha has been done with uh, this information that uh, by the Fraser Institute. I found myself sitting in a hot tub two days ago with a friend of mine. <laughs> who was bragging no about salacious details. <laughs> yeah, please. There was, We're talking about assessment there. There were two or three of us. <laughs> please let me finish. Uh, she, her son, they're very wealthy, and their son went through private school, and she was talking about, and I let her go on about all the great things then I found myself talking about the Fraser Institute and those that know me, I'm a pretty laid back guy. That water got hot. I would, I am so annoyed with what the Fraser Institute does. So I'm pleased to know uh, that parents can choose to not have that information go. Uh, I'm very proud of that, uh, or I'm pleased with that. I'm also pleased that uh, if the parents choose to not have their kids do that, that we have another mm -hmm. formative assessment. Uh, so uh, with those two things and uh, a very good case laid out by you, I support this motion. Okay. Is there anybody else who wants to speak on this? Oh, Trustee Brzezic. Mm -hmm. I cannot support the motion. If you keep doing what you're doing, you keep getting what you're getting. I appreciate and respect, and truly I do, there were the changes that have been made to the assessment. <clears throat> I truly believe in having done a lot of advocacy for a whole lot of years, that if we just go ahead and can participate in this, there's not the right kind of pressure on the government to make the changes it, ne it needs to make around the issue, around the misuse of, of the data. So and, and we have to tackle that issue first. And to me, part of the way we do that is by continuing to, to educate parents and to continue to give them the option of, of opting out and not making those calls. And I completely respect what our DPEC chair is saying, but I've, uh, around the relationship between parents and principals. And, but parents can also contact the, contact the school themselves and ask those questions and, and, and institute, uh, instigate those conversations rather than, than it being the principals in this case. If pe parents are aware of this issue, they, they know about <coughs> the foundation skills assessment. This has been going on for a number of years. I think it's time to take a stand and say no more. Um, I'll just be quickly to address some of those points. I think nobody's saying that parents can't still opt out. That's still up there. Parents' choice and parents' right. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that parents do know about the updated. FSA. I really wish they had changed the name. It's you know it comes laden with all this baggage that <coughs> now everybody has to unpack. <laughs> so um, I, I think that I think that now more than ever with the updates, it is a good opportunity to educate our parents about the updated FSA because I don't I just don't I think that there has been you know lots of criticism that was you know well deserved previously, but I think the updated assessment. Um, is people don't know about it. And I think that that um, is, is a reason as well to encourage more communication about this issue. Um, May I quickly follow up to that? Sure. Thank you. I guess what I'm saying is I don't see, I, in reading the motion, the old motion, I don't see anything that prevents that. Because all the old motion says is provide parents with the facts, give them the opportunity to opt out, and no, okay, we won't make a follow-up phone call, but that certainly parents know enough that if they have further questions, they can make the contact. Thank you. Uh, That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Trustee Wright. Um, thank you, Charlene, for bringing up that point because to be honest with you, it's not something when I was considering this that I had considered until you mentioned it. And you are bang on correct. One of the most important relationships that can occur between a parent is the one at the principal at their school. And that can help a lot of things, solve a lot of issues on a lot of different uh, 
to cases and if a principal any chance we can get to put a principal and a parent together to discuss the education of his or her child is a positive thing as far as I'm concerned so thank you for bringing that forward question uh, trustee Bob had one thing she wanted to say can we let trustee Bob speak yeah and then I'll just keep it brief. I just wanted to share that I appreciate the discussion and I um, take to heart the need to advocate. Um, there are, you know, some some things that we need to, to put pressure on the government for, for sure. I do see the value of, um, of this assessment <coughs> process and value the work that's gone into it, so I'll be supporting. Okay. Call, the, call the question. Okay. All those in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? Opposed by Trustee Berzovich. Um, I'm... That completes... That completes... On, on, that, on, okay. on the issue, mm -hmm. I, I would move that the, that the Education Committee recommend that the Board uh, write to the Ministry of Education um, and most strongly urge the Ministry to um, make the information received from the Foundation Skills Assessment available only to uh, teachers, parents, and administrators. I'll second that. Okay. I'd, I'd like to add a friendly amendment to that, if, if that's all right with you. Um, in addition, or or in in another way that that they that we could get the ministry to to achieve the same thing as to not have them report it on a school basis, um, to report it on a regional basis, or or a district basis. Some something that doesn't. I mean, they could still provide the data, but it would be it would be masked in the sense that it wouldn't be done by school, so the Fraser Institute wouldn't be able to compare it by, by school, and I was wondering if we could add that as, as, as another alternative to just privatize it. Just and for um, release information on a larger aggregate level than, than school-based. <laughs> and just speaking to it, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm appreciative of the BCSTA for starting or going ahead with this, but I think we have to mobilize the full uh, 60 districts and BCSTA and our friends in the uh, NDTA as well, and BCTF. Mm -hmm. It's the friends. Okay. Uh, any questions on this? Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yeah, all, also on that um, point of topic, I would like to make a motion that we direct staff um, <laughs> to um, develop a, a mechanism by which um, parents of grade four and grade seven students um, can opt out for, for those portions of the FST, um, FSA that don't have to be sent to the province, um, that they be provided an opportunity to opt out. Okay. Is there a seconder for this motion? Trustee Berzovich seconds. Yeah, and the reason I say that is, and the reason I bring it up is because, um, like Trustee Robinson, I was not aware um, as a trustee and, and certainly as a parent that. Um, that such a mechanism was available and and certainly had I known I would have opted for that so it, I mean I think the FSA as an assessment tool is great but reporting out on a provincial basis so that the Fraser Institute can use the data is not desirable for the school district or in the best interest of our schools or or students so to the extent that we can encourage parents or at least provide them with the information so that they can make an informed decision on that basis I think it's <coughs> important Any other questions on this? Is it, is, do you, are you guys clear on what? Yep. Okay. No, it, it, it's in our communication. Yeah. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay. Uh, I see. Nothing on unfinished business. Any questions tonight? No? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and we have a special board meeting right after. And just a reminder that the actual board meeting again this month is a different Wednesday. It's on the 18th. It's, it's not the fourth Wednesday. The, the meeting where Steve, myself, Carrie, and John are all gone. So, 
Second. Brennan and Sam. <coughs> um, any objection to adjourning? Seeing none. Thank you, everyone. Thank you yeah. for a wonderful. Hard